Um, so my goals are to discuss what does a, a cross-curricular framework look like. I want to give you some practice with a very feasible, easy tool that you can use to bring student-driven STEM inquiry approaches into a community's classroom. And I want us to brainstorm some further ideas for how can you take STEM ideas, practices, and integrate them across the subjects. Um, so let me get a sense of who I got. Will you please raise your hand if you teach elementary school? Elementary school, okay. Um, what, secondary humanities? So, okay. Science, math, we're my STEM people? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. PhD candidates, you know, right? Everybody else? Okay. Um, great, awesome. That helps me out. Okay, so you've got a task. Um, there should be handouts on your tables. As we go through, you can jot down notes on those or on the back. I want you to think about how can you bring STEM practices into your humanities classroom or vice versa. So if you are a math teacher and we're talking about literacy, we'll be touching on some of those things, how can you bring those ideas into your classroom? Now, if you are, I forgot to ask about vice principals, support staff, anybody here? Mm -hmm. Because we can also be thinking about this on the level of the entire school. How can we create a culture of STEM throughout the entire school? You can have one. I'd like to begin, though, by talking about the nature of truth. So I hope you all had your coffee during the <laughs> This is an important thing to consider when we're talking about cross-curricular things, is what does it mean for something to be true in your classroom versus someone else's? So tradition says that the humanities are all about that subjectivism, while the natural sciences are what we would call STEM, are empirical, they're objective. So the traditional idea is that the disciplines are separated, not just by content, but by approach. And I like to challenge that idea, and I know a lot of other teachers that like to challenge that idea. So take a moment, talk with the people at your table. If you're not at a table with someone, uh, find a friend. In your discipline, what is truth? And what do we have to determine that something is true? If you teach more than one subject, pick your favorite. I know, I'm asking a lot. It's a big discussion. Okay, so take like two minutes and then we'll share them. What is true? Okay. Well, I teach science, so we use the scientific method to determine what is. Were there enough handouts? Yeah. I, and I took an extra one oh, okay. for another teacher. Oh, okay, cool. So when I when she when she says what is true, and what, to me, I think about things that I can touch. And I say, okay, this is a rock. Tangible. This tangible. I can touch it. It's a rock. Um, if I have to test something and apply or test a theory mm -hmm. and use the scientific method, uh, method approach, then I think about what is true. Is it true or is it not? But we also have to discuss, you know, it may be true at this time based Correct. on the information that we have. Mm -hmm. This is why things have progressed mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. at that time that's what we believed us to be true and then later on we find out with other evidence and things so, like that. So when we have changes. things that are that fit in that category, I refer to them as a theory. Mm -hmm. I say, so it, is it true or is it not true? And if it's either or, then it's proved, it's gonna be true uh, or not true unless proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. And then we think about a theory that could possibly someday down the road be proven. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, there is isn't much difference. Mm -hmm. People say it was not the facts. It is. <laughs> um, you, your conclusions have to back you to say that you go a step further. Okay. All right. Who would like to share out about your subject? Tell us how about me, um, the county you teach in, subject, and what is true. of 
analyzing those sources. That's the thing students have to do. So they're supposed to actually make subjective and objective decisions based upon the type of sources, whether, not, whether it be letters, diaries, artifacts. Mm -hmm. So. Fabulous. So for those of you who might be close to the water, um, in social sciences, history, what was your name again? Matthew. Matthew talked about the idea of using primary and secondary sources, of analyzing those sources, of using that as evidence. That in the social sciences is how we determine what is true. Fabulous. Others? We've heard from a humanities. Can I hear where my science and math people who are like, no, it's not the same. Don't try to tell me that it's the same because that's not Yeah, I think humanities helps the sciences understand how language works, how perception works, how we sort truth, how we sort evidence. It's very difficult to, it's, almost, it's impossible to do science without language and communication. Mm -hmm. And what we deem to be true now may not be true later. Mm -hmm. okay. Based on the evidence that we currently have, right. things are always changing and evolving. It's based on the evidence that we have now, but maybe not later. And she made a great point. She talked about biases based upon cultural belief and who the person is at that time and what they believe to be true. So I thought she made a good point by saying that to the team. Yeah, cultural bias. Mm -hmm. Who we are impacts how we receive information and what we do with that information. And that's true of our students too. So I'm teaching a text that could mean something very different to my students depending on where they're from, what their parents do, where they were born, that sort of thing. Yes. If I could just pitch in for the, uh, the, the one good thing that uh, engineers and scientists have though is to, to do control experiments yes. mm -hmm. and to gather data. And of course, measurements change and get improved and theories can mm -hmm. change because of the experimental results. Mm -hmm. But that's something that uh, for a person like me who's been leading a whole life in, in the engineering area, mm -hmm. Truth is really what is provable. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. <laughs> Which is a, li a little different. Understanding too that uh, we can, what we think is true today, an experiment years from now could prove it wrong. Right. But uh, yeah, good. Right. So the idea of experimentation, um, of and, and replication, and control, experiment, control. Right. The idea of having a method for arriving at the truth, which then of course can be subject to revision. Raj. So I, uh, I teach also in the area of business and entrepreneurship and one of the things for me that has been helpful with the students that uh, we work with <clears throat> is the idea that truth lies between knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know. And I guess that integration um, it, between the sciences and the humanities helps us kind of bridge that gap. And it's, it's really borrowing off of that. This, uh, the, this quotation from Thoreau that got from Confucius that is to know that we know what we know and that we do not know what we do not know that's true knowledge and the fact that the word true is in there kind of um, reminds me of this intersection again. So the idea of the acceptance of uncertainty as part of what can be labeled as true. Yes ma'am. Uh, my name is Estella Johnson. I teach in Scotland County at Middle School. I teach social studies. And for us, I kind of agree with them. Our truth can move in, our, in a sense. We know when Martin Luther King was killed. That's a fact. I feel like that's our strongest truth, the things we know that are fact. We know Abraham Lincoln was killed, those things. But why they were killed, who killed them, our truth can move so many different ways. And you learn through archaeology, through time, maybe what we thought was true wasn't true. And you learn new things and new facts. But a lot of it is perspective and social studies. In our classrooms. So in the literature classroom, um, we say that because language is fluid, it's always changing. Truth is dynamic, right? It changes. Mm -hmm. Reasoned, peer-supported evidence is needed to say that something is true. And this gets into the control um, and the replication. And if someone else reads it the same way and can pull the same evidence, well, then that leads well to your argument. Um, truth is created collaboratively by the author, by the reader, by the critic. It's a process that involves multiple people. 
Um, and then finally, truth exists in multiplicity and ambiguity, right? So the text might mean this or this, or it might mean both at the same time, right? And that's the sort of stuff that drives you STEM teachers crazy, where the kids that are really STEM-minded, that they're like, no, what is the answer? Just tell me, right? In literature, we embrace that uncertainty as part of our truth. So when I was interning in the genetics lab, um, I got to get a glimpse at what truth means in the sciences. And I think you'll see some similarities, uh, including the sweater that I'm wearing in the picture. I didn't notice that, but I was actually a nurse for the same sweater. Anyway, um, so in the sciences, because there are so many unknowns, truth is still dynamic. And thank you, my science people, for contributing exactly what I thought. Um, reasoned, peer-supported evidence is required, and truth is created collaboratively through people who experiment and replicate and publish and revise, right? Everyone works together. Okay, so why is all of this important? And this finally brings us to the idea of multiplicity and ambiguity. Again, people in the sciences and maths may be not as comfortable with that. But no matter what subject you teach, we can pull from this discussion about truth the fact that we can all use student-driven inquiry in our classes. We can all teach research approaches. We can all teach students how to innovate to make solutions to problems. And I think it's important that we teach them a degree of comfort with not knowing the answer, right? Going through that process, not getting that instant gratification, and really being tolerant of learning as a problem. Okay, so now I'm going to jump into an inquiry method that I learned from a physics teacher. Uh, it's very STEM-like. I use it in my classroom a lot. I know other humanities teachers that do, and I think it'd be a good thing um, if you're interested in bringing some of those STEM approaches into humanities classroom, you can use this. So on your handout is the procedure. So as a teacher, you wanna put this in your binder, look back at it, but you don't have to worry about that right now because you have it and this process you can just do as the student, right? You get to be the student for a minute. This is always fun. We like this. So in a minute, I'm going to show you an image. With your group, I want you to generate questions about that image, right? So this is how you would present it to your kids in your classroom. But there are some rules. You have, uh, like I said, two minutes. You need to write down every question as it is spoken. This is the hard one. Don't answer the questions yet. You want to answer those questions, but don't do it yet. You're just asking them. And if anyone happens to make a statement about the image, find a way to turn that into a question. Questions about what we're going to do? Why do they look like zombies? <laughs> why does the scientist look so interested in the background? Look, right. why are they like observing the children? Are what did you say about the background? Why does the scientist look so interested and curious? Yeah. Why do we have like Secret Service agents? Secret Service? Yeah. You know, that. <laughs> why is Donald Rumsfeld laughing why in the background? Why is Rumsfeld yes. in the picture? What are some questions that you have? Who wants to start us off? Questions right, about this image. All right, hold on. There you go. Okay, I'll start from the bottom. Um, question number 10 was, why is there a creepy government overtone? All right, very nice. Do you want all the questions or just the... Just one, two, whatever you want to show. One question was, uh, it, what is the implication of eating the corn on the health or the bodies of the individuals? And the other one is, what are these genetic biohazards are referring to? Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, first question is, uh, why do the kids look like zombies? <laughs> That's the first one students ask. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. yeah, I wrote a match out with the kids. Sorry. No, that's perfect. Okay. 
Uh, second question is why do people that are high the glass do not look like zombies? Uh, what sense of corn? What's written on corn? Is this a biased picture? Why is the Secretary of State laughing at the kids? We assume that the Secretary's done. Okay. All right. There's only one. Anyone else? All right. Very, very nice questions. So you would do this with your kids. You would talk about the questions. Um, and then this is the next part. You are going to select researchable questions from your list. So again, you would talk them through the criteria. I want you to pick one or two questions. They need to be complex, so mm -hmm. not just yes or no. They need to be researchable, so something you can look for and find out. And they have to show some potential for gaining knowledge, so something you're going to discover, clarify, quantify, define. So take a moment or two with your table. I want you to pick at least one researchable question. And if you don't have any that you think are researchable, you can revise until they are. Places across the U.S. and the world. Yeah. yeah. So what's the, what's the interaction? Yeah, between mm -hmm. between agriculture, agriculture business, business, and, and the government. government. Yes. And you'll find that there are single corporations that own everything and have little satellite businesses. In our case, uh, we thought that the uh, the basic question is. Uh, what are the dangers of genetically modified organisms, if any, and what are these biohazards? That, that's really the main theme, and you can, you can spend your whole life studying that. <laughs> so the question was, what are the dangers of genetically modified organisms? Such as the case. Others? Another question? Yes, ma'am. Ours is... What does science, government, and environmental leaders have to do with what is in the food? Good question, especially for social studies people, right? What do these government leaders have to do with the zombie corn that we see in the image? The zombie corn. Um, children of the corn reference, did anyone pick? That'll go right over your student's head. They're not going to get that, but... Okay, so you do this in your classroom. What is the next step? What are kids going to do next? They're going to do the research, absolutely. And that's what's so exciting about this, is it's not you saying, okay, I want you to do a research project about GMOs. The kids have a stimulus text. They arrive at the questions on their own, and then they take them and they go with them. So um, here are some of the questions that my 11th grader Again, English class generated based on this image. Why do the kids look like zombies? What does Monsanto mean? Why is former President H.W. Bush in the background? Rumsfeld is in there too. Um, why are all the adults behind glass? Why was this image created? And to what extent is this an example of propaganda? We were studying propaganda at the time, so that was a good moment for me. Um, <laughs> great, when they make those connections, that you're like, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, we were looking at this as a piece of propaganda while they were studying genetics in their biology class. So I did link up with the biology teacher to make sure that we were doing the same sorts of things at the same time. So take a moment, talk to your table again. How might you use this in your classroom? And even if it's not this particular image, because I know that doesn't work for everybody, every level, how would you use this technique? And then we'll share out. Well, I know I could use this because I'll be conducting a big uh, STEM project-based learning research project with my AP language juniors. That's so the same class she awesome. has. <laughs> and we're posing them the question, how can students affect public policy? And so they're going to come up with, you know, something such as genetically modified organisms, whatever, as like policy concerns or hot topics. And then they're going to research them and they're going to have to pitch a public policy to a policy panel. Everyone from energy to education. 
etc. Yeah, so it's, it's a big project we've been working on all summer, putting together. But I think this would be a great. I'm gonna use this probably like the first day of school, just one, just plant that seed. Yeah, that's a good way to get them engaged and to think about you know different topics and then. And you're not swaying their research. They're, they're really coming. Up, they're coming. It's true inquiry. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Which makes a huge difference in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I find that a lot of students, you know, coming from the middle school that feeds my high school, mm -hmm. that they don't have any hands-on mm -hmm. experience in collaborating or even doing labs. All the labs that they've done, they already know the outcome. Right. So when they get to me and they're like, well, what are we going to find out? I said, well, you'll find out when you get there. And you're going to tell me yeah. what you found out. And they're like, that's interesting. I like it. I you think know. this would be a good way to just to, to provide, provide students with models of things. Like something that they can toll, touch, look at it, manipulate it. What is it? Or if you have something that was once put together, if you put these pieces back together, what would it be? Yeah. How would it be used? This could be good too to uh, use as an intro to every unit. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, kicking off the modernism unit, oh, yeah. you could use a piece of World War One propaganda, oh, that is a idea. or um, you know, kick off to transcendentalism. Yes, in any artifact yeah. or text, yeah. and then generate, um, try to trying to get them to focus on your major themes. Yeah. Major you can just read a short video lines clip. Of Rather than you like giving a presentation about the historical background of a literature period, mm -hmm. they can figure it out based off their inquiry from a picture or a video. And I like the fact that it taps into multiple learning styles. Mm -hmm. It's just not one linear learning style. You get your visual learners, your kinesthetic, you know, audio. your audio, everybody working together. So I heard some really fantastic ideas as I was floating around. Um, one that I heard again and again was, I could use this to get kids excited about something. Whether it's the book you're about to read or the unit you're about to do, right? This is really good for that. Starting them off, they don't have a lot of pre-existing knowledge. You show them something that's interesting, whether it's a visual text um, or a piece of an article, a poem, an advertisement, something to get them excited and asking questions. It's really good for that. And I love to start units with this activity or similar one. So looking at bigger questions, it's important to consider how can I tie the research that my students are doing back into the content that I want to teach. So eventually the place that we got to in my classroom was, how does the author of this text use visual language to communicate to a particular audience? Is it effective? And would Aldous Huxley, because we were reading Brave New World, agree with the basic argument of this image, why or why not. So as kids are generating questions, like you, you're not totally relinquishing power. I can never totally give up power in my classroom and control, I just can't, right? So they might be having this time where they're getting to explore something that interests them, but eventually I'm gonna bring it back to what I wanna talk about. So to kind of move on from that and look at bigger picture things, uh, my humanities people definitely check out the American Library Association. They have amazing lists of texts that have scientific themes. So they're fictional, but they relate to the sciences in some way. Um, there is a link there, or if you just go to the ALA website, they have the lists there. Just a few that I thought of, top of my head, Brave New World, Never Let Me Go, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, does anyone teach that? That one, fantastic, fantastic. Um, Swamplandia, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, and Silent Spring. All of those are really good science-based texts that you can bring into a humanities classroom. Um, I teach high school, so those are all definitely high school texts. But again, going to the ALA can help you out in finding. Are there any others that you can think of that you teach good texts for maybe middle school, elementary school, science-based texts? Okay. I'm always interested what people come up with. So the last thing I want to talk about is interdisciplinary collaboration. And I touched on this briefly, talking about working with the biology teacher to line up our units. 
that actually turned into a much bigger project, which was uh, my Keenan curriculum. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. So it was with my Ivy Juniors. The bridge units were our mass media and the genetics. And basically what they did was in their genetics class, or sorry, in their biology classroom, they designed startup companies, which actually I got that. Raj put me in touch with the creator of that website, so Keenan is good for networking. Um, so they created a startup company that addresses a global problem with genetic research. And then for me, they created an advertisement of that company. So they had to use the things that they were learning about, ethos, logos, pathos, how do we convince someone, how do we use language to do it, but based on a company that they had created and their own idea about how can we apply genetic research to solve a problem. So, this is an example of the ad that one of my students created. So his startup was to take bacteria that exists on the sea floor and they naturally produce methane, modify them so that they could live in the engine of a car and then the methane could be used to power the car. How cool is that? Where are my NC State people? Can we get started on that? That sounds <laughs> awesome, right? So that was his idea. And then in my classroom, he created this advertisement. Also really good if you want to bring in some of those computer skills. Like obviously we use some Photoshop in here and learned how to do that. Right, so he has that visual language with the rhetorical question. What's under your hood? He's got the flashy car. He's got the cool looking bacteria. Um, and then at the bottom it says, at Envision Motors, we use modified deep sea bacteria to increase horsepower and dramatically cut emissions of all of our engines. That's what we call innovating for a clean future, right? So very cool idea. And the kids came up with such great stuff. Um, bees that didn't sting, that sounds great. Um, you know, a, a drink that would make you smarter, right? So they were applying those skills and those ideas that they learned in biology, but then learned how to communicate them using, again, the skills from English. So in my class, in addition to the advertisement, they wrote me a short essay explaining the techniques that they used and how they were able to take those complex genetic concepts and make them understandable to their audience. So yes, I had to go to the biology teacher a couple times and be like, is this right? I don't know what this means, but again, that's why you should collaborate. That's why you should work together. And then I also took this and we made it a bigger part of uh, the school. We made it a bigger part of the community by presenting at our international festival that we have every year at school. So because it was a global problem, my kids then got to talk about these problems with other students, with teachers, with people from the community that we had come in. And here's a little bit of what that looked like. Okay. Now, at this point, I had kind of like taken a back seat and I was just sort of letting them go and do their thing. Um, and I think that's an important part when you're talking about bringing these ideas together is you have to kind of give them some space to foster that authentic discovery. So some of them, you can see um, on the maps there, that group was, uh, their project was on making food more nutritious, modifying it for nutrition. And so they had a little game where you had to uh, try to guess different vitamin deficiencies in different parts of the world, which it's B vitamins in America. But yeah. Um, I had others that, again, the, the group that was, did the smart drink, they had different states, different countries, rates of graduation from high school, how could this be applied to help people learn around the world. Um, I had groups that dealt with uh, garbage disposal, with curing things like allergies, um, really great ideas, and they were able to share them. All right, so last thing, and I think we've got time. Perfect. 
I hope you've been brainstorming how you can bring some of these ideas into your classroom or school. So please take a few minutes, get your ideas together, think about them, and then start talking with the people around you. Right? How are you going to use these? What are your ideas? And then what do you still need in order to make this happen? Talk to each other. We'll come back together in five minutes. I need time. <laughs> yeah, you do need time. Um, and then you need somebody to collaborate with. I was going to say, you willingness to collaborate with. I need time and willingness of cross curricular. Yeah. Yeah. Cross curricular. Yes. Cross -curricular. Because it's just, there's no There's no There's no Yeah. Yeah, because. I, I got to teach in an IB program for one year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And so my goal has been to, to to do more of my ELA from that focus, where um, I'm doing I am doing it from a humanities approach, which the IB focuses on. So I want to do more of my ELA work using the social studies and the science, but. Trying to get the science teachers. The science and math people do not want to work with. Really? Really? <laughs> they 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 really they really do think it's two different worlds. They think it's math and science uh -huh. and social studies and language arts. I mean, I it's not think, personal. Yeah. It's, it's not. just they, they don't have much background. They don't like those subjects. But you know, so it's. I think it depends upon one level the year of teaching level how long have you been a that's, teacher that, that's um, a big, that's a what your foundation was when you came into teaching were you encouraged to collaborate were you encouraged exactly. because as a first year teacher at the school I taught at right. that was an expectation it's an expectation you we had a common planning for our grade level discipline and then we had um, common planning of course with all of right, the other right, right. so that way we had um, right. Uh, collaboration between everybody and right. say, oh, you're doing this. Well, this. Oh, I could tie this into this and we could do this together. Mm -hmm. Which is what and, I did with IB. Yeah, and, we had to do with that. And our principals were in our classroom every day, multiple times a day, walking through every wow. classroom. So wow. when they, when we had our faculty meeting weekly and they, they said, oh, Angela, I like what you were doing in your class. Will you share that with everyone else mm -hmm. and how you and um, whomever right. are collaborating right. and so everybody was always feeding off of everybody else's mm -hmm. energy right. positively right. exactly right. Yeah. and that encouraged a we did grade level collaborations we did um, you know um, it was just interdiscipline we right. did everything right. and what you saw going on in eighth grade we were like oh well okay you're learning a portion of this in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. When you get to eighth grade, you'll learn it on a deeper yes. level. What yeah, kind of thing? Right. It, yes. We did all of right. that, right. and right. we always right. shared that right. in faculty. Right. It right. became you, you. You were not going. Oh my gosh, I got a faculty meeting. It was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I wonder what we're going to talk about yeah. today. Yeah. You know who's going to. You know who's yeah. going to be highlighted today. Right. Right. And all of that was always right. promoted, encouraged, and and right. when you have that kind of environment, right. you're more willing. You're not separate. You're not, oh, we're sciences, or we're math, or mm -hmm. we're humanities right. over here. You guys right. are talking about school culture. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. really that makes the big difference in the willingness to collaborate yeah. I think that's the and people issues. making time to do that. Absolutely. I, I think it's, do they function as separate departments, or do mm -hmm. they function as interdisciplinary teams? Yes. Yeah. And it also depends yes. upon your schedule. How are you scheduled? Mm -hmm. What time line are you in? Yes, school? that's right. Because yeah. right. I've moved it's to high school, to and it's not like that. I don't have common planning right. with my yeah. with my colleagues who teach the same subject as me, mm -hmm. much no. less Never. anyone Never. else. Never. Yeah. I need 30 minutes of planning, so yeah, you know, for six like, different periods. For six different periods. Yeah. So, um, oh, originally, the meeting, yeah. <laughs> The way yeah. I got this biology teacher to work with me um, was we were at a bar. And I it. Like that. Yeah. Was kind of, like that's what you have to do. <laughs> you initiated it yourself. <laughs> After school, but that's really, off campus. But I, you know, she thought. I thought that her. I that's heard weird. about stuff going on in her classroom. It was yes. exciting. Exactly. I was like, we're right. right here and let's talk right. about this. And that's how this project began. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think that you do. If the structure isn't built into the schools, which right. so rarely it is, you've got to find yeah. something to do. Yeah. You have to find that common thread somewhere. Right. right. And, and as the English teacher, my most effective thing that I can do is I 
I go to their, um, I go online, I read through their case and guidance so that I, can, I know when I set it up, I say, okay, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, this is how can we work together. But I'm proactive. I don't wait for them to say, I'm coming up on this. Because it's easier, I, because I'm skill-based, I can read and, you know, and I aspire for my standards. I don't have to be um, as sequential as science in their basic as science and um, I'm not sequential and social at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I integrate all the time. And social studies is, is much more so. But I can, I can apply my skills to their subject so much more easily than they can to me. Yeah. And see, and I disagree with that because as a you science teacher, I, I, you cannot have science without, without literacy. Language. You it's cannot. If, if they don't understand the language, they're not going to understand can. the content. I think she's talking, speaking in reference yes. pacing for science. Your pacing then, guide. And then, because sometimes they have the benchmark assessment. Right. So yeah, trying, but you still have you the still ability can. to integrate. You still can integrate. Based on your, if you are, if you're doing pre-assessments mm -hmm. and and post-assessments, you know where your students' understandings are. And when you get into that discussion... See, that's the issue. Some people aren't. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'm a little different. In, I guess I'm a little different yeah. in the science realm than, than the others that you have been. And then it right, may be know. that they're not doing it. It may be that they're not, they're not experienced in doing it, and they need some help. Yeah. Well, English is hard mm -hmm. because we don't have... <laughs> there is no pacing guy. <laughs> it is rocking science. I mean, it is. is it? You're there always is going no back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Or if you and have teaching, one, it doesn't work. It's teaching yeah. concepts at the same time and going exactly. back and repeating and coming yeah. back, which I'm sure science, you, you do there have is that. A lot of and then applying it to a different tip. But yeah, but there's not always a very clear scaffolding as far as yeah. English goes. And, so, cause, and you're teaching thinking skills. Yeah. Yeah, which is critical in all disciplines. But I incorporate writing and they have to read, they have to create. Um, my students created um, a, a, a children's book on, um, on the rock side. That's great. And, they had, great. and we took it to my, my kids, my personal kids, so um, elementary great. school, and they used that That's as a teaching so tool. Great. And the elementary right. students evaluated the content. Yeah. Awesome. Was it easy to read? Was there proper grammar? So did they what they would develop the imagery? Together? Yes. Awesome. Yes. And then I teach at Cape Fear High School. Um, and my kids go to or went to Eastover Central Elementary and so we got feedback from that teacher, from that teacher. and their students and then my students could say okay I'll see okay so I could see that the that the language was maybe just a little too young for fourth grade right. or maybe my language was a little too right. above the fourth grade level right. and they really got to reflect and they got to revise their books so and then save it back. More difficult for them? is to break it down to K through two. Yes. And they think it's easy, but it's really hard because you have to be so simple. Yes. Mm -hmm. Make so it so simple. accessible. Would anyone like to talk about an idea you had for how you could bring this into your school? And I also heard a lot of you talking about challenges, and that's good. Um, challenges and how to overcome them. Would anyone like to share out something the table talk about? Challenges, ideas, ways to overcome. And I'll tell you, we talked about how it might be difficult to get other teachers to collaborate or to get your principal to buy into this idea. When they hear STEM, I think it thinks science and math, and everybody else thinks whatever. And so we said from the social studies standpoint, it would be difficult you know, to say, hey, you know, ELA doesn't collaborate because they're so focused in middle school anyway on the end of year test. And so was the principal. To get them to say, okay, we're not going to read a thousand passages and answer questions. Mm -hmm. We're going to do something different. I think it can be difficult for the principal mm -hmm. and the other teachers. So, what are some of the ways that you overcome that? If that is a situation in your school where it's like testing, 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 go in, close your doors, what are some ways that you can help change that culture so you can do more of these things? Um, okay, bring in, I'm always bringing data, kill them with that data, <laughs> right? Like, it's, it's shown to be effective, therefore. Yes. Yes. <coughs> I was going to say, you know, putting your students' work samples out in the hallway so everyone can see what's going on, whether they 
collaborated and made a poster or a project or they graph something with data and just letting everyone see what's going on because I get a lot of comments from other teachers and other disciplines saying, oh, you guys are learning about that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of sparks a conversation. Um, have yet to find one who's willing to collaborate, but at least we've got, you know, the road laid down, the path getting ready to start. Yeah, just keep trying, and that is a great thing. Putting work out there on a bulletin board in the hallway so that people are walking by, they see what you're doing, it looks cool, they want to talk about it, that can be the beginning of a collaboration. Um, also have one. Yeah. <laughs> also having like research based, um, not just the data, but having research based things concerning education that shows how it encourages critical thinking, which all of our students um, need. Mm -hmm. And so with the critical thinking piece, that will help to improve some of the, um, the data. Because if they have the critical, critical thinking piece, then that's going to improve everything. Absolutely. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as I think I talked with uh, this group, even if your school is very oriented towards the tests, those tests are interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. In English too, they're going to have a science reading on their end of course mm -hmm. test, they're going to have a history reading, mm -hmm. they're going to have to apply the skills to fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So even in these cases where you know, we're supposed to be driven by the test, driven by the test, those tests are not designed for us to close our doors and to never talk about any other subject. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, I think the secret is to identify an area. Start with a single one. Mm -hmm. Pick one topic using your data that you can go to your, your professional learning team and say, this is one particular place that we can improve. Mm -hmm. And then find the expertise in the building that can help you teach that. Yes. It may be an art teacher, it may be a construction mm -hmm. teacher, it may be that's somebody along those lines. And then I think the next step is to make sure that what whatever group come up with stays within the same time period that you're used to teaching, that you feel comfortable staying within. And then you, once you have those two defined areas, it's significantly easier to move forward with that collaboration because you, you're not worried about spending more time than you normally would, so on and so forth. Okay, awesome. Yeah, good. I know, I like what you said about identify an area of weakness and then find someone to help you because I know that year after year after year, my students miss the inference questions on the English 2 EOC. Smiles from the English teacher. Every year. Okay, so who's really good at teaching inference? Science teachers. Science teachers are good at teaching how do we take two pieces of data and develop a hypothesis or another conclusion based on that. So that's a really good point. Like the resources are there. Anyone else? Thoughts, challenges, solutions?